you ever wondered how humans and robots work together at Amazon? From the moment a product enters our fulfillment center until it heads out to a customer, Amazon technology helps our associates in so many incredible ways. Amazon introduced our drive unit robots in 2012, which led to 300,000 new full-time jobs. These are the stow stations. They use artificial intelligence and computer vision. Yeah, pretty cool. This is the palletizer. It uses computer vision to stack totes of products. There's so much cool technology that goes into this. Oh yeah? Like what? Well, like 2D imaging, a laser sensor, high motion performance, and 165 kilogram load capacity. Wow, amazing. Our tech vests help communicate with the robots to keep us safe while working on the field. I think your tech vest could use a little more tech. Thanks, but I think my vest already has everything it needs. Incredible. I know, right? With Amazon's human and robotic powers combined, we are building the future of technology together. Welcome, welcome everyone. Just in case you've never been before, my name is DJ Knight. We are here with Cedric Ross. We are here at an Amazon Fulfillment Center, EWR9. And we're gonna get a little bit of a tour about how things work behind the scenes after you click buy on Amazon.com. Now, throughout this tour and this presentation, we're going to have a lot of things going on. We're also going to have a lot of giveaways. So regardless of the platform you're on, if you can find your way to twitch.tv forward slash first inspires, that is where the match is going to happen, where you're going to enter to win in those giveaways. And it's also a pleasure to see you regardless of the platform you're on, whether you're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Twitch. So thanks for tuning in. Now, Cedric, behind me is just a symphony. It's like a... It's like a beauty in motion in regards to robots. So tell me what, what we're seeing behind us. Well, uh, in these uh, four large walls, what you're looking at right now is our Amazon uh, robotic drive units, those orange robot devices, and they are over here in our super highway, and they're carrying these yellow storage pods. The storage pods contain uh, Amazon customer items, and then items that will eventually become Amazon customer items. And all over here is a lot of storage as well. But the activity happening right now in this particular superhighway is our storage pods are going to our Amazon employees, my great colleagues, and they are either bringing the storage pods to our employees so that they can stow items into inventory or they're coming to our employees so that our employees can pick items from those storage pods. So, you've already mentioned that, like, that a lot of these are Amazon customer products. Is there something in the background that figures out what products people are gonna need in an area? Because that's a lot of product that is not moving right now, but there's also tons that are. Well, in a word, technology is really what helps us, but even if I took a step back further, I would start first with the customer. Quite honestly, we always start with our customer and we work our way backward. So we think about what technology can best assist us in making sure that we're fulfilling customer packages. Right. Or in this case, that could best fulfill the, our employees, my colleagues here, so that they can help with the fulfillment process. So the uh, technology behind this is uh, we're using AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services technology, um, to identify uh, items that we need to pull for our customer orders. It's a kind of a, a, a long story, but to start off with, the first thing that happens is we need to bring items into the building. Right. And then after items are brought into the building, this, by the way, this is really awesome. I'm looking yes. at it myself. This is the first time I've been in this building. I'm just being honest. This is great. <laughs> um, but once the items actually get here, this is where we're going to spend a lot of our time talking about that process. Right. So I want to ask like a thousand questions, but <laughs> I feel like one of the bigger questions to ask is like, how have these robots helped increase efficiency with Amazon products being delivered? Well, you know, the, the thing that I think is most always important is none of this would be possible if it wasn't for our Amazon employees just doing their work every day. Um, and we know that this technology has been a great assistance to that effort. Um, the Amazon drive units are able, first of all, to drive in narrow spaces, which means that we can use these yellow storage pods 
and condense the space in which we place all of our customer items, which gives us, in essence, a whole lot more space to utilize for customer items. So in a facility that's an Amazon robotic facility, I'm oversimplifying and I'm being quite general here, um, an Amazon fulfillment center like this can store about 40% more items than a non-robotic fulfillment center about the same size. Again, wow. it's, it's, it's generalized, but condensing that space is really helpful. So that's one big win right there. Um, and we're talking about millions and millions of customer items, to be clear. Right. But another win is these uh, robotic drive units can actually bring these yellow storage pods, basically bring the work to the employee, as opposed to having the employee go to the work. Um, even if that saves a step or two, which, to be honest, saves a lot of time, and it gives us some really great opportunities to do a lot of things in one area. Now, our workstations are also um, ergonomically friendly so that our associates, our employees, can be able to perform their job um, as comfortable as possible. Um, it's a great process. And then, once they're done doing the work with the yellow storage pods, the storage pods can move on to whatever the next phase is. But it's, it's great. With all of the items there, it makes the process a lot easier for us. It's a nice way of like basically having shopping carts of a store and just <laughs> like not having to push your cart anywhere to have, have the cart automatically come to you. Yeah, that's, I think it's kind of fun. That's kind of awesome. Now, what are some of the key areas of this building? So yeah. I feel like one, we have like this massive city of robots. I imagine that's kind of key in the process. Yeah. So like our customer storage area, mm -hmm. um, obviously a really important area. Another key area would be our um, inbound delivery area, where items actually come into the building. All right, I feel like with that, it's probably time to go see an inbound area. So, you mentioned size, and that having the robots helps increase the amount of space for customer items. Yep. And you said there was a generalization of about 40%. Now, how massive is this facility? Because this is a pretty gigantic place to be. Yeah, our uh, facility here is about a million square feet uh, in diameter. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a lot of uh, what I would call uh, productivity space, which mm -hmm. to me is really great. It's very helpful for us. Um, and as you can see, a big chunk of that was in our customer storage area. But right. then there's the other area. There's production. And there's the main floor of production. And then we have the second floor of production. Right, right now, we're up on the second floor of production. Um, and I can show you and talk to you about a lot of that process. Um, I know that you had, when we talked initially, I was talking about inbound. We're still in the inbound area right now. Right. But some of the things that are happening behind the scene in inbound is um, the items that need to come into this building are being delivered by trailers. Those trailers need a place to go. Right. So we're going to have those trailers come into one of our inbound bay doors. Mm -hmm. um, they'll park themselves in an appropriate location. And then once that happens, we will open up uh, the, the bay door and then open up the trailer. Our team will then uh, come in to that trailer. They'll first do a, a visible uh, inspection to make sure that there's no damaged goods, um, right. that no visible damage. And then they'll start unloading those items according to their training. Um, safety is really important for us, so they want to make sure that they're doing everything the safe way. But once that happens, they'll have those items unloaded and staged so they can take another good look at our items. We'll go as far as unpacking those items at some point and we'll even inspect um, every single carton. We'll do like a, a six point check to make sure things are safe. Right. And now if something for whatever reason is damaged for any reason at all, we can then start to go through whatever the problem solving process is. But let's assume the happy path. The happy path is everything's great, it looks good, we're going to unload those items. And now I am going to oversimplify this, but just to make sure I'm telling the story well, we're going to distribute those items throughout our building mm -hmm. evenly for our employees to receive those items in their workstations. Mm -hmm. And then our employees can start to stow these goods that came from our inbound delivery mm -hmm. into our yellow storage pots. Okay, so we've got yellow storage totes. These have come in off of a truck to, from another Amazon facility. That's right. And it makes it easy for them to add these to the inventory onto the yellow plastic storage bins. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you nailed it, really. Um, the only little things that I would add to that is we also have barcodes, you'll notice, on all of our uh, yellow uh, totes. Mm -hmm. So we can tell the contents of everything in each of these yellow totes. It's important for us because, in essence, we're recognizing the items already in the building, and mm -hmm. now we're transferring the item from the tote over to the yellow storage pod. Okay. So if we're having storage pods, are like similar items, let's say I'm ordering a book, are the same book distributed yeah. into the same spots into the storage bins? Well, not exactly. So that process, to me, this is the best thing, the best part of the process. Um, so I, I don't know if you know, but <laughs> I started Amazon in 1997, which is, um, we'll just say it's like yesterday for now, okay? All right. So, so I'm going to do the injustice of saying you don't look like you started <laughs> at Amazon in 97. I'll just throw that out there. Well, <clears throat> well thank you very much. I really Here appreciate for you. that. Here thank for you. you. <laughs> so once those items are, uh, for, for me, what I learned a long time ago in 1997 is that, you know, because I worked in a, in a warehouse or in right. a fulfillment center, and I had to do a lot of the, the processes that you see today. We didn't have robotics. We didn't have as much automation. Um, we had technology and we had a lot of hard work for sure. Um, when I first started, Amazon sold only books. And I remember in the first couple of months, we, uh, we had our shelving system that looked a lot like a library, like a Dewey Decimal System. Man, um, I remember the Dewey Decimal System and searching <laughs> for many a book based on the three digits yeah, and then a period. Right? Like, okay. I mean, you know, it's, it was slightly different, but, but the items were alike and put in the right, uh, in, in a particular type of order. Right. Shortly after I arrived uh, at Amazon, we started dismantling the, that process and then rebuilding, reconstructing the whole process to do what is known as random stow, which is what we're doing right here. Okay. So what is random stow? Random stow is where we can take goods from our, uh, these yellow totes in this case, okay. place them into bins um, randomly, in essence. And the principle is that if we have items randomly stowed into our bins, it makes it easier for us to get items uh, when we're picking them because there's more likelihood that we're going to have the same type of items that customers um, are ordering closer together. Right. Um, we don't have to divide and, and, and search as much uh, with the random still process. Now, there is something that we call bin etiquette. Okay. So you can't have the same exact item in uh, a bin, uh, an adjacent bin, um, in one of our yellow storage pods. Okay. Now this is, on this one is our, our larger bin, so you're only seeing the bins uh, in a vertical way. Right. But in our other bins, which you can kind of see over there, yeah, these, right on cue. <laughs> these um, adjacent bins, we shouldn't have the same item right next to it. Right. What we try to do for bin etiquette is think in terms of, I'm going to stow items into the bins, but I'm going to stow them in like a diagonal way or just to make sure I don't have the same exact bin right next to each other. Because if I'm picking the next uh, process over and I'm grabbing an item, I potentially could accidentally grab the wrong, this, it is the right item, but it's from the wrong bin. Right. Now that won't hurt us in the long run, but we want to make sure our inventory is 100% accurate. Right. So bin etiquette, helping our next person who's doing the next process is really important for us. So you I feel like you're answering a question that I was going to ask because right now I see like there's a light that projects to the size of the bin and there's like a purple light. So that, what is that purple light for? Yeah, well, let me dive in on this one. This is, this is fun too. This is super techy, fun stuff for me. I love this. This is the audience for it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, breaking this down a little bit, uh, my colleague here is she's actually doing the process of stowing right now. She's taking items out of her bin and then she's scanning it it's a stationary scanner right there. And she is able to place the item, in essence, anywhere um, that she has available bin space. However, purple light is shining to indicate areas that we would not want that item in. Uh -huh. Maybe it's because of the bin etiquette rule. Maybe it's also because of the size and dimension of the item. Or it could even be that we have so many items already there, we don't want to overstuff that bin. Because you know what happens when you overstuff a bin? item could fall out. Oh. And nobody wants that. True, because then I'd imagine that would delay shipping. But I, I imagine there's tools in place to keep that from being too crazy. That is correct. Okay, so 
how you mentioned that you've been here since '97 at Amazon. That's crazy. I did take a I did take a small little <laughs> coffee break for a couple of years. Nothing wrong with coffee okay, breaks. Thanks. Coffee is delicious. All right. Uh, how are things different now, efficiency wise, time wise, compared to how things were back in '97? Like, well, how has the robotic system changed that? Well, I would first start by saying how things are the same because okay. uh, I think it's important to indicate one of the things I missed when I was on my little coffee break was uh, the camaraderie of our employees who work in fulfillment centers. Like the vibe is the same. Everybody is, uh, they're pretty cool. They, they, they get along with each other, communicate well. Um, it's just kind of a fun atmosphere. I literally, I remember um, missing certain fulfillment centers that I had been in in the past. So that part is really awesome. Okay, so the parts that have changed though, uh, in terms of technology, here in this building, we're using Amazon Robotics. You can see our orange uh, drive units there and these yellow storage pods. We still have some uh, fulfillment centers that are like 1.2 million square feet. They are um, what we call sortable fulfillment centers, which means they carry small and medium items like this. This is a sortable fulfillment center. Mm -hmm. We also, by the way, have non-sort fulfillment centers, which carry large items. Okay. Uh, some are robotics, some are not robotics. But the robotic technology, we talked a little bit about some of the advantages there, but we also have a lot of good uh, systems that also assist our employees to fulfill customer orders. The technology, um, the cloud uh, software uh, that we're using to help drive some of these processes, mm -hmm. all of that innovative technology, many of which came in-house um, to me, has really made a difference. We had nice. systems in the past, but I think this is, this is really great. All right, so I feel like thus far, we've gotten the look over the robotic city. I'm, I, I can't help but to call that robot city. Uh, so let's say, as a customer, I go to Amazon, I pick out some things, and I click buy. If we're looking at the story of a purchase, it seems like with inbound with the stow process, that's Amazon bringing in things at the facility from either other Amazon facilities in other businesses around yep. the country, yes? Yeah, small, or medium businesses or um, products that Amazon is uh, uh, also picking up from vendors, yes, that's correct. Okay, so in the process of the buy, mm -hmm. this is the process that has things in stock so that Amazon knows, all right, we have this many of them, you can buy it. So if we click buy, it's already in, the next place, I think, is the area where we go from there, yes? Yeah, so we'll go from um, actually stowing the items into inventory. Okay. Um, and I just want to say thank you to my colleague for helping us out. I Appreciate mean, I'm it. not here for the five high fives. Let's do it. <laughs> Appreciate right. it. So next on our tour is looking at the next step in the okay, process. Okay, so yeah, you're right. So now this looks like a very similar kind of situation to what Stowe was. That's right, and you'll notice that it's actually, we only walked just a couple of steps away. Right. So this area is our, uh, our picking station. This is where we pick customer items. And uh, my colleague here right now is not only demonstrating, but he's actually Hi. picking items. How's it going? <laughs> Good to see you. So what's happening right now is um, he's picking uh, customer orders. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break this down a little bit, and I'm gonna use me as an example. Let's uh, assume that I have ordered um, a couple items at Amazon, right. and I happen to live close by this area. Okay. Um, now, in a happy path, uh, we're thinking that, let's say, just for the sake of this discussion, the items that I picked actually, or that I've wanted to purchase are actually here in this building, and we can get it to me, a customer, pretty quickly. Right. Okay, so now they're in this building, and they're gonna be in one of these particular storage pods. Okay. Before, our employees actually start even the process. We have, uh, with our technology, already assigned, uh, found all of the items that we need to pick. Okay, so we know what all of the storage pods are. And we're gonna stage those storage pods closer to where our employees are. So that when I start working, system doesn't have to go, the uh, uh, drive unit doesn't have to go way deep into our storage area. All it needs to do is go maybe a, a few feet and it's already ready. It's like, I'm, I'm ready for you, are you ready for me, kind of okay, thing. Okay, so that means that the system is already processing the position of where the workers are going to be on the floor, and the robots are already moving everything to be in place well, before they start? Almost, but more accurately, what the system is doing is identifying where our customers are, Okay. where the customers are we're trying to serve. Secondly, 
we already know where all the workstations are. <laughs> True. So all it's got to do is go from where our customer items are to the nearest employee. Because so is that based on like shift schedules and like just pre-planning? Oh no, it's not based on any of that. It's just based on proximity of where the items might happen to be out there. It's just going to find the nearest operational workstation. So a station that we actually have an employee at. And it's going to park pretty close by. So it doesn't matter if it's me as an employee or someone else as an employee performing the task. Right. Once we start the process, it's just you know the next one, the next one up. Right. Okay. So now the items actually show up to our workstations. Okay. And our employees will actually uh, use their computer monitor to see a picture of the item that we're trying to pick. Okay. He is going to actually see the the shelf level and the bin location. And what's more is there's going to be a light shining where we want the item to be picked. Now there's a it's random stuff, so there's a lot of different items in every bin. He's going to pull an item out, and it needs to be the right one. Um, if it's the right one, he'll scan. Well, either way, he's going to scan that item, and there's a barcode on that item, and there's a big stationary scanner. And if he's right, he'll see that there's a little light uh, according to the yellow tote that we need to place the item into. And then he'll tap that and start that process all over again. But let's say he just got the wrong item for some reason. Mm -hmm. He'll just see on his monitor that that's the wrong item, and then he'll look and see if he can find the right one. Wait, Put that so one back before he even one. gets to scan it, is telling him that, or is that after like you scan it? After you scan it. Okay, so I was he's got to take it out, that's and then he'll have to <laughs> scan it, and then he'll see. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, that's you know, this is the wrong item. It's like, oh, okay, he can put that back and grab the right item. But it's also they have the, the pictures right available to make it easier. Yeah. So when you're digging through a drawer, like, all right, well, what, let's find the right thing. That's exactly right. It okay. does make it a lot easier. Now, the items that are going into these yellow totes are a bunch of different customer items all mixed up together. Right. Again, it's sort of like a random stow principle. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll sort out the customer order further downstream. Right now, we're just picking items so that we can get really good workflow in our building. So but bunching once, up the things that are going to be going out shortly to make sure that they're closer together to properly sort them. That's right. Okay. These are all the items that are going to go out today. Um, and probably, you know, within, within the next hour or so, give or take, right? Right. Um, and so once he's picked about uh, the right number of items in each of these yellow totes, he'll advance them down this, uh, what I have known as the tote elevator. Okay. I'm sure it has a more robust technical name. But it looks like a tote elevator to me. Does it look like a tote elevator It looks elevator like an elevator, and yeah. it looks like totes are on it. I would go with tote elevator. I support you. Thank you. In this I movement. appreciate that. All right, so, so they come after they've been put in, after we've clicked buy. They are picking the packages yeah. from the bins, pushing them into the totes, and the totes then go to the tote elevator to move on to the next stop. That's correct. Well, once, okay. right, once we stow, once we click buy, that's right. Then you pick, and so then, then it goes on to the next stop. And then we go to the next step in the process. All right, so I feel like... How often are those robots moving? I feel like there's a lot of movement of robot robot right now, and I'm wondering if they do they stay in movement. So, our, as long as we have workstations that are actually um, in operation, so if we're we're working, we work, we're at what I call a 22 and a half uh, uh, seven day a week operation. There's about an hour and a half. That's kind of slower time. It's a big uh, shift change and everything. Right. Um, around that time, there are probably little to no stations actually operational. So at that time, it's not a lot of movement with our robotic drive units. Right. Maybe there's a couple of ancillary things. But really, when we're actually in production, our, and our employees need to actually utilize the robots, and they need to utilize these storage pods, that's when you see the activity. Awesome. All right, so I have more questions. I feel like we could be asking questions all day, though. But I love this. With the movement comes, like, what happens if something drops on the floor. Yeah, okay. So, um, I mentioned that something could potentially drop, drop on the floor. We never want to see that, by the way. It's right. not cool, it doesn't help the customer in any way. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but in the event that something does fall onto a floor, we actually have our, a team of employees who will go and use tech vests okay. to go into the robotic, uh, or the, this, customer storage area right. and retrieve those items or perform other parts of their job as well. And lo and behold, we have someone here with a tech vest on. <laughs> we do. 
Hello, hello. How I'm you DJ. It's a pleasure to meet you. What's your name? Ruben. Pleasure to meet you, Ruben. Say hi to everybody at home. Hey, everybody. <laughs> hey, Ruben. So, how are you doing? I'm good. Good to see you. So, you are the holder of the vest. Yes. How does the tech vest work when it comes to the robots? Because there's a lot of movement out there. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of movement in there. And whoever has these vests that I'm wearing right now are able to control anything that happens on the floor. So, for example, if I walk on the floor while this is not activated, I can get hurt. Everything is moving right now, but I can show you guys how this actually works. Okay. I have an example of drives here. These robots, let me tell you something. These robots <laughs> are amazing because they actually can carry about 750 pounds. These okay. pots are heavy, so right. these robots are top notch. So I'm gonna just show you how, if I was to walk on the floor with my safety, with AKA a safety vest, and this, this we're gonna see what it affects does on the robots. Right. As you can see, you see all the blue lights that blink to all the robots see around. You see all the stop movement. That's because everything is linked to my vest. And I'm gonna tell you right now, this is the safest way to go around and pick up items. Pick up items, you make sure you do it quick. You make sure that everything that you're doing is safe. And make sure you always physically and visually just match everything that you're doing. So once you finish with this, you just get out first, you safely get out, and you have to turn off the vest. I can see the lights blinking right now. Yes. And so, you will see every single robot will turn off the lights. Awesome. So like once you're done, like everything, they already know that they just go back to work. Yes, everything is linked up. We always awesome. double check, make sure everything is linked up. Because remember, this is the reason why we have this for safety. Sweet. Yes. So, Thank you very much for your time, Ruben. It's awesome to learn a little Thank bit you. more about those robots. Thanks, Ruben. Now, Appreciate it. For those Welcome. of you tuning in, we are here at Amazon EWR9 Fulfillment Center. It's an amazing thing to have already seen this process, right? If we're going through an order of Amazon, we've clicked buy, we've seen how things get entered into Amazon, we've seen how things get picked out and prepared, and we've seen how those robots can kind of have some safety precautions and measure to make sure that nobody gets hurt. And we're going to get a robot close-up here very shortly, but in the meantime, we're going to start a giveaway. So regardless of what platform you're on, if you're interested in winning a $100 Amazon gift card, it's going to be four of those given away here very shortly. Now, if you're not at twitch.tv slash firstinspires, you might want to get there for this part because this is our first giveaway of the night. There are going to be more. Now, with this, to have a chance of win, you must be or you must have an Amazon.com account, and you must be in the United States. But other than that, Type in exclamation Amazon Future Engineer into the chat to start entering for this $100 Amazon gift card. There will be four people chosen. And while you're entering for this giveaway, we're going to head to the robot close-up. See you shortly. Putting together a handle to move robotic drive units. Tim joined us straight from the Air Force. He was the only person in my entire career that's ever just said, hey, Give me the hard job so I can learn everything. So we'll just take our robot for a walk. I definitely had a sense of pride serving. It's all just about doing the right thing for your country, doing the right thing for yourself, doing the right thing for the folks around you. Some of those same things carry into Amazon. It's about being part of a bigger thing. So in the Air Force, I worked on some pretty cutting edge avionics equipment. But with Amazon, that skill set really propelled me into working with robotics. It's the little orange robots. They move things around, and it, it enables our fulfillment centers to be more efficient. They're very reliable, but when they do break, it takes a bit to move them from point A to point B to be able to perform maintenance. So what I did is mocked up a quick apparatus to move it around, a, a handle. Uh, we ended up calling the drive pusher. Right? Did you come up with this? I did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> clip this in on the end here. We tried to actually get him to call it the T-Mac 5000 or something that had to do with his name. It's a common tool that's used now and I, people don't realize, I think, where that started. So I was able to submit my design through our patent process. Now my name is attached to that as the inventor, which is pretty neat. With Amazon, really anyone from the ground floor to the highest echelons can come up with a design or, a, or an idea and run with it and uh, they'll support you fully. Sometimes the small things have the biggest impact. Hi, I'm Nicholas. 
I'm Jordan, and we're in FIRST Robotics Competition Team 1902 Exploding Bacon. Hi, I'm Theo. I'm Ethan. And we're part of the Robotic Wolverines, which is a FIRST LEGO League team. A FIRST Robotics Competition Team competes in a game challenge with a 125-pound robot against thousands of other teams around the world. It's really exciting today to go behind the scenes with two Imagineers, Brian and Karin, and get to learn about their involvement in Star Wars Galaxy's Edge with the animatronics. All right guys, here we are at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, the largest single land expansion that we've done in Parks and Resorts history. Here at Black Spire Outpost on the planet Batu, we have multiple attractions and a very immersive land for all of our guests to experience. My role in this was to help bring to life some of the characters through our audio animatronics, especially over in Rise of the Resistance. Mine as well, partnering with all the different creative partners in Lucasfilm to help bring some of the show action and elements to life. Now we're going to take a rare behind the scenes look at our animation training lab. You guys are going to really get to see behind the curtain here. What do you think? That's great. Yeah? Let's go. Let's, Let's go. go. All right, so here we are at the animation training lab. We kind of have a progression here of different hand technology. So down at the end come from an A1 figure. A lot of these come from 1960s and World Fair technology. More recent, we've been designing with electric. Is the advantage of the electric actuators um, more precision in the controls? We definitely get a little bit more control, so you can get a very specific performance. The robots that we build might have just maybe like two actuations to pick up a box or something like that. When the Imagineers took us to look at the animatronics, I found it very interesting to see how all the different moving parts work from moving of fingers to the moving of eyebrows. This is one of our prototype arms that we've been working on that kind of helps show the range of motion. So again, it's all about the storytelling and trying to pick the right tool for the right job to tell the right story for our characters. It's interesting that you mentioned having to pick the right tools and different approaches. In FIRST Robotics, we have to do a similar thing, working within our own capabilities to see what we're able to accomplish. I see a lot of these things and I'm, and I'm just more and more excited that FIRST is it being able to prepare me. At least I know what this stuff is yeah. to a certain extent. It was very clear that the technology that we use is used in many of the same ways here at Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And it's very inspiring to know that in the first robotics competition is going to prepare me for future careers, potentially right here at Disney World. One of the best parts about being on the first team is if you think of an idea, you can build it, test it to make sure it works. And if it doesn't work, try a different idea. I also love the community that FIRST offers. Everyone's really supportive of each other. Being a force for change really means a lot about sharing everything. Whether we're teaching each other on our team through our challenges, or we're remotely connecting with international teams, or even our programs like First Like a Girl to bring up awareness for women in STEM, it's really uniting everyone together. This year, Disney and Lucasfilm are teaming up with FIRST Robotics as part of Star Wars Force for Change philanthropic initiative. We're on a mission to inspire the next generation of heroes and innovators. To learn more, go to firstinspires.org slash firstrise. Welcome back to the show. My name is DJ Knight. I'm standing here with Cedric Ross. We are here at Amazon EWR9 Fulfillment Center in New Jersey. It's been an amazing trip thus far. We're kind of walking through some things. So if you've not been here the entire time and you just happened to tune in, we're showcasing what happens after you click buy at Amazon.com. So we've already seen the influx of when you bring things in. We've already seen what happens when they take things out, put them in the totes to prepare them for packing. And right before we went, on, right before we went to a break, we said that we were going to give four people $100 Amazon, Amazon gift cards. I feel like now is a good time to give those away. So our four winners of those $100 Amazon gift cards are Underdog4, Gibster99, Outlaw Pickle, nice name, and Joe the Pro 1010. The four of you just won. $100 Amazon.com gift cards. You'll be getting a whisper from the moderators shortly about how to claim those. So thank you for tuning in. If you're in on any other platform, whether you're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, get to twitch.tv slash firstinspires and get in so you can get in on our next giveaway, which isn't going to be too long from now. Now, I feel like our first Tech Challenge students that watch are going to be excited about this next area. We're at the robot repair zone. So first things first, how often do the robots 
really need work. Well, um, it's kind of a, a fun story about the robot maintenance and and you know well-being in terms of making sure everything's working well. Um, so let's talk about the batteries really quick. Okay. Um, so like, where would where would the battery be on the robot? Actually, I feel like we could. I feel like we could get in here. Let's 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 get on in here. So where on this robot would the battery be? Okay, so there's a lot of technology inside this nice uh, uh, plastic shell. Okay. You can touch it if you want. I was afraid so, to. I didn't no, want to touch okay. it. I don't want to have somebody come around the corner. You're not supposed to do that, DJ. You're with good friends here. You're, I appreciate you're, you're well it. You're well taken care of. All right, so the brains of the operation, you know, are more just just around here. There's um, also the brawn of the application. Cause aren't yeah. the, like the, the, the posts where That's they're picking right. up the bins right exactly around here? Exactly right. And, and in fact, a um, couple things that you should know. The, the posts that, that will lift our yellow storage pods will come from here, but you have to make sure that it's actually got to, it's going to find the right area to pick up the storage pod. It's got to be centered. Right. So there's a sensor right here to be able to tell if it's lined up right to pick up the okay. actual, the actual uh, yellow storage pod. Right. Sensors are really important for our, our drive units. We have a couple of other sensor uh, type of things. One, there's something on the bottom of this that reads these uh, two-dimensional barcodes um, that we have. Uh, I call them fiducios, asset tags, bar barcodes, and they actually help our uh, robotic drive units navigate um, along with other things like our, our Wi-Fi, our connectivity, mm -hmm. and our cloud. Um, and, and programming. Um, but there's a battery in here as well, and that battery uh, can really sustain a charge you know, throughout the, the workday for our um, Amazon employees. Okay. So you can you definitely get a 10 hour charge uh, with our uh, drive units at any given time. Um, the drive units, when it needs a charge, mm -hmm. will actually drive to a charging station by itself. Right, but what makes it even cooler for me is we could see a, a drive unit carrying a yellow storage pod performing a task, and it may have an indication that oh, it looks like there's you know going to need to uh, recharge pretty soon. Uh -huh. It will still be able to calculate the function, the the next function, to make sure it completes its task. So and if it complete, recognizes while it's in the middle of a thing that yeah. it needs to charge. It'll finish the task and then go to charge after. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, you said drive, and that reminds me that we have a lot of first students in the audience, and I imagine that they're going to have just as many questions about this robot as I could come up with. Yeah. So if you're watching and you have a question, type in exclamation Q, space your question in the chat, and then you can ask questions that we can have Cedric answer while we're standing here in front of the Amazon robot. And also, if you're still typing in the exclamation for the giveaway, that's not going to be the one for the next giveaway, so you don't have to. But you mentioned that a charge for one of these robots can last a full work day. Yeah, it lasts a full work day. There's a second type of charge that happens as well. Okay. So this charge, uh, you don't need to do uh, too often. Um, and I, you know, to be quite honest, I'm forgetting exactly the, the duration, but uh, uh, within every few days, I believe, you can charge these drive units um, and it will sustain that 10 hour charge. However, if you don't take the time, if the drive units don't actually get a longer charge where they're just sitting for you know a, a few hours really charging up, then every time it goes through that shorter charge, it could actually uh, diminish the, the time the, the charge time in between. So by not going for the longer charge, you're diminishing the battery life. That's right. So it makes more sense to have the robot go for a longer charge every couple of days, is what I'm gathering. Or whatever that duration is. I'm right. not sure if it's every couple of days. So it'll have a short charge uh, 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 frequency, and then it will also have one long charge in between those shorter charges. Now, the thing that you just said that got me immediately confused and excited was that you said the long charges are only a couple of hours. Yeah. How long is a short charge? And a short charge allows us this thing to work, lifting how much can these robots 
lift? Well, some of them can lift upwards of uh, over 700 pounds. Some others can lift over 1,000 pounds. Depends on the, the drive unit. Okay, that makes my question even more crucial. <laughs> so if we're talking about a long charge, yeah. that doesn't have to happen all that often, yeah. being a couple of hours, how long is a short charge to where this robot knows to go get charged and then just, all right, it's been a short amount of time, I'm back on duty. Well, the longer charge is, is definitely over a couple hours. So we're talking about more than a couple hours. The shorter charge is a little bit uh, over an hour, okay? So it's a small, it's a shorter charge. The longer charge is, yeah, we're, we're talking about hours here. I do want to make sure I don't forget about one thing that's really important. I know we're talking about charges and that's really important. I can tell it's important because your whole body language has changed <laughs> that I want you to know about this piece of info. I want you to know info. about what's happening while we're having this conversation what? and what we just left, right? Okay. We went up to the, to the picking area and we got to see how items got picked. And remember how they got put onto that conveyor belt and sent somewhere? Well, right now those items that got sent somewhere are being packed. Um, they're going to end up at uh, one of our ergonomically friendly workstations right. where we have our employees who will be able to take those items and actually pack them into boxes. Um, just it's hard to see on this particular tour, so I wanted to make sure I called that out because I don't want us to show up and see a bunch no, of boxes and not know exactly what's going on there. So we already have gotten a question from chat. Yeah. I believe it's Nick Flyback. And I can't remember... If the question was what happens when the power goes off in the facility or what happens when a battery dies in a robot? Okay. Well, let's do both. Okay. All right, let's start with the facility. I'm here for learning. Let's do it. <laughs> if uh, for any reason the power is out of this facility, well, that would mean that ultimately we wouldn't be able to operate. Now, um, do we have secondary uh, lighting and power to allow our associates to, to appropriately, safely, um, you know, walk somewhere, uh, yes. But can we sustain productivity with the power outage? Not here. So what we would automatically do is we would think about, um, and I'm going to oversimplify this for this example, think about where we are um, in, in you know, the region, in uh, North America on the East Coast, and we're thinking what other sites are nearby that do not have power outages. Okay, so let's divert some of our, a little bit of our shipments in this location, and this location, and this location. So even if the power went out, customers would still get their products on time just from different Amazon facilities. That's exactly right. Our goal is to make sure that no matter what occurs, we can still accommodate our customers. Awesome. So yeah, we're, gonna we're just going to divert. Like my shipment was already in this building. We talked about uh, it's pretend, I'm sort of making it up. It's, but. it's fine, okay. we're still in the process of after clicking buy, yes. you bought a thing, we're <laughs> right? still good. Okay, all right. So the, light, the power went out, and we're just automatically going to divert my right. shipment to another facility. Now the people, the employees that are working in that facility, they're going to feel a slight uptick, but uh, because we're spreading it out pretty evenly, it's only going to be a crazy. smaller, exactly. Right, so that's actually awesome that you have the system in place to make sure that people still get their items in time. Yeah. It's just somebody's going to work a little bit harder for a bit, but once the building goes back up, I imagine it's just going to get clarified from there with this current facility. That's right. Now, what happens if the power goes off in the robot? Yeah, so if our, if our drive unit goes, goes down for if power, well, it would be the battery not right. working, or there might be some sort of malfunction. To be honest, we do a really good job of maintenance here, so we rarely see malfunctions occur. Right in this uh, facility right. because we actually perform a regular maintenance schedule. We'll open it up, we'll clean it, we'll make sure everything is looking good, we'll do some diagnostic testing from time to time, and then send it on its way. We do all of that to prevent breakdown. Nice. But assuming that maybe the battery is out for whatever reason, we should actually have an understanding as to why the power went out on this drive unit before it actually made it right. to its uh, charging station because it's programmed to go right to its charging station. Right. And from there, we can start to analyze and uh, resolve any problems that may have occurred. Nice, and that's why we're in the robot repair room to kind of solve that. Exactly. Now, we got another question from chat. Yeah. Underdog4 wonders, what happens if you have an odd-shaped package that doesn't fit in one of the standard bin locations? Well, um, Underdog 4? Yes. So 
So um, if we have a circumstance where there's an item that might appear to be not fitting in one of the bins, um, one of two things is, should be considered. One, the item that we're actually uh, trying to receive should actually fit into one of our bins, and we have different size bins in our yellow storage pods. One of them is uh, nine inches, another one is around 18, and, and I think we even have 22 inch uh, bins. So we have wow. lots of variable sizes. But what's really important for you to know is nothing even comes into this building unless it can fit. And we know that because we've already assessed the, the weight and dimensions of all of our items. Because frankly, some of our items that actually belong in a bigger facility, mm -hmm. what I call that non-sort fulfillment center, right. for like the microwave ovens are bigger, they actually have a different place that they have to go to. So it's our job to know exactly what uh, should come in this building. Awesome. Now, we've been in the robot repair area learning a little bit, and I feel like we've, we're still in the same spot yeah. of that story of after you click buy. That's we've right. seen inbound to where packages come in, they get sorted into their proper storage bins, and we've seen pick where they get sorted into the totes, yep. to where the totes then go into the tote elevator to move on, and some of them get packed, some of them get placed into other totes. But next up, we're gonna find the next step of the process, and I'm a fan of it, it's the palletizer. Now the palletizer, I'm gonna give you one hint that there's a really big arm. That's it. I want you to figure out what you think the palletizer is gonna be before we get there, but there's another giveaway. Remember earlier when I told you that if you were here, if you were on LinkedIn, if you were on Facebook, if you were on Twitter, that we were going to have more giveaways? Now's one of those times. So if you want to enter this giveaway, same rules apply. You have to have an Amazon.com account, and you have to be in the United States. The giveaway link for this one, type in in the chat, exclamation first inspires, just like this Twitch account name. So if you are on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook, head to twitch.tv slash first inspires, type in exclamation first inspires in the chat to be one of the next four people who have a chance on winning a $100 Amazon gift card. And in the meantime, we're gonna head to the palletizer. See you soon. We have our own culture, our own language. It's important to like take care of each other, look out for each other. Safety is always the number one priority. We want to be the most safety-centric organization in the world. We have created a virtual reality of our fulfillment centers to identify hazards and learn what they look like. I have my access path. We're now using our robotic tech vests at nearly every Amazon robotics facility. This vest is actually protecting me, so no matter where I am, it's still sending out that signal that tells the robots, hey, there's a person here, don't come close, stop or go slow. We have a new digital checklist for pit operators to use. They'll sign in to make sure that the people that are attempting to sign in have the proper training, and then they'll go through a digital checklist that prompts them of what to look for. We use the Amazon Kindles. They're one of our most important tools. It can keep them safe because they can check to see if the trailer is docked in, because if it is, then we can go inside. There's many things that we've actually changed in our operations through the use of technology that actually helps speed things up, but at the same time, it makes it safer for our associates to do. We're constantly striving to be a leader. We are obsessed with customer experience, and we are equally obsessed with the safety of our associates. Lucasfilm headquarters in San Francisco to meet with the students from FIRST Robotics. They'll meet BB-8 and learn more about how he was brought to life. Now we just have to go and get them. After you. It reminds me of how all of our robots have a central motherboard. I mean, that's the way he breathes, so it's probably important. Maybe he's our tour guide. Let's follow him, see where he goes. Hi, I'm Samyukta. And I'm Avanti. And we are a first LEGO League team called the Thunderbots who have been competing for over six years. Hi, my name is Katie. I'm Nathan. And we're from the first robotics competition team 1678 Citrus Circuits from Davis, California. Hi. 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 
So I'm Matt, and I see you've already met BB-8. <laughs> yeah. So I've done 25 years in the wow. film industry, working on animatronic creations. I'm one of the creator and operators of BB-8, from an engineering standpoint, that is. What's the biggest difference between like making a rolling droid versus another droid like R2-D2? Well, R2-D2, for one thing, he's very stable. He has three wheels. With BB-8, his body is the wheel. And the way we do that is that he has a fairly large weight in the bottom of him. And and then he has some gyroscopic sensors. And it's a bit like what you have in your phone. You can tilt your phone around and do games like that. And if you touch him, he'll restabilize himself. I never took much thought into it. I'm like, okay, it's probably all just CGI. But after he showed us everything and told us how BB-8 was made, it just changes your whole view. So how does BB-8's head move around? Is the body like a giant magnet? Well, in this universe, we have the force. <laughs> yeah. So we can cheat. No, we don't. <laughs> but we have the force of magnets, you're absolutely correct. So straight through the center axis of his body, there's a stalk that comes off of it that moves around, and the sphere, if you like, doesn't touch this top part. There's some magnets in here, and then the head sits on top, so wherever you move the stalk, the head will follow. So one of the interesting things is that he doesn't have a battery in his head. In fact, what we're doing is transmitting power through the body, so if I take the head off, you should see the light go out in the, in the eye there. Seeing the possibilities with BB-8 opened up a lot of ideas in my mind of things I might want to do or things I'm interested in. So I believe you guys have brought some stuff with you to show me, which is exciting. Absolutely. We're really excited to show you what we yeah. brought. Yeah. I see Lego and robots. So yes. Already you have yes. me. In First Lego League, the robot game part is completely autonomous. So you won't see us having any controllers, it's all programmed. Wow. So you told us about how R2-D2 has a system where he has two main wheels and then one that just kind of follows along everywhere right. he goes. So that's actually a system that we've incorporated into most of our robots. Right. So this here is called a caster wheel. And they use casters yeah. on R2-D2s? Yes, it's basically <laughs> our version of the R2-D2. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's very cool. I can really see how it would have advanced my learning in robotics, especially with the Lego aspect of it. I would have just loved that. All right, so this is our robot. During the game, our goal was to score those yellow panels over there and those orange cargo balls into this structure. Wow, it's zippy. Again, in film, we usually cheat. We have several robots that do different <laughs> tasks. So trying to get to do all the one thing is really cool. I love the way all the bits are just, yeah, amazing. I can honestly say I really don't know how I would get over some of those challenges. And I think it's amazing. It just shows what a team can do. Well, I've had a really fun day meeting you guys. It's inspirational to me. I want to go away and build more stuff. I'll be looking out for you in the future. Maybe there's some future <laughs> droid builders that come and join our team. My favorite part of FIRST Robotics is the skills that you learn, both the technical skills and soft skills, like collaboration and communication. Realizing that the design process was pretty much the same for BB-8 and also our little robots was something that was, I think, really inspiring. This year, Disney and Lucasfilm, BB-8 and myself are teaming up with Global Robotics Community First as part of the Star Wars Force for Change philanthropic initiative. We're on a mission to inspire the next generation of heroes and innovators and hopefully some future droid builders. Learn how you can get involved at firstinspires.org slash firstrise. Welcome back to Amazon EWR9. I am DJ Knight and I am joined by Cedric Ross, encyclopedia of Amazon knowledge. Now, we just got done coming from the robot repair shop. We did let you guys know to type in exclamation first and fires in the chat to find out who of you is going to win a $100 Amazon gift card. There are four winners and those winners are Key Plazu. V Mans, Bama Fan 65, and Nutrition Tech. The four of you just won $100 Amazon gift cards. Make sure to watch your whispers very shortly because the moderators are going to reach out to you to get you your goods. Now, with the palletizer, it's a massive robot arm. What does the palletizer do? Well, and um, so it does actually put together a bunch of these yellow totes onto a pallet okay. so that we can uh, shrink wrap it um, and deliver to another location 
But the reason why we utilize this is to assist our employees in building the pallets, one, and then two, to make sure that uh, these items are going to a destination where they can be merged with other items. So it's um, like earlier when you were talking about how this location handles small and medium sized items. Right, a sortable. But if they're getting center. something like a microwave in addition to their small items. A non-sort. They go on to the totes or into the totes, the palletizer puts them on a pallet and they get shrink wrapped and taken to one of those facilities. Or they'll be taken to either those facilities or a facility where both items will come together, right? Okay. And so a place where we can merge those items and then um, usually you see this when customers prefer to have all of their goods sent to them in one shipment as opposed to piecemeal shipments because they come from different locations. I'm that, just hearing that boggles my mind because I've always wondered how is that Amazon gets so much stuff to my house within two days. <laughs> so to know that so much goes into getting things in individual totes that gets into other Amazon fulfillment centers and then join with other things before they get sent out, that's impressive. It's a, it's a, a lot of, um, of work. I mean, over you know, 22 years of our technology came into play and in understanding the best way to do these things. Oh, there you go. You're seeing this uh, working right now, right? Right. So, cool, you see the red light there. That's awesome. So that palletizer right now, robotic arm, is okay. lining itself up so that it can place the item in the appropriate pallet. Right. One, it has to go to the right pallet. Two, it has to go in the right position uh, for the pallet. Now the, uh, the grabber there, I'm sure that's not a technical term, <laughs> uh, on the arm actually also has sensors. So as it's coming down to pick something up, it's lined up well, so right. it picks it up properly. Um, and then it's cleared enough space as you can see there, you probably saw a couple of my uh, employee colleagues, Amazon employee colleagues go in there to perform a task. Every time that happened, the machine was shut down. Right. Um, so it only operates when we have a clear space. Right. And now it's finding its location and it's trying to fit and go into the right spot. Now, right. sometimes we do have to calibrate the machine as well right. to make sure that we're, we're efficient. So our technicians are available to help and make sure that that happens. Right, so why is it so important to have so many safety precautions when it comes to robots working with humans? Because I feel like there's a lot of safety tape here telling us to not go any further than here. I think it's great that you notice that there's uh, tape on the floor to indicate um, certain uh, safety precautionary areas. One, uh, safety is our number one priority. The safety of our employees, the safety of you, our, our visitors, um, everyone in this building, we feel like we need to make sure that we have adequately given you um, the, the kind of safe measures. Just saw I put the pallet, the, the tote on, I'm sorry, I was just... Did you see it? It's like, yes, you I, saw I, it I saw it in my peripherals. That's super it great. Placed it. it, was like, yes. So that's why, I mean, I, I think it's really important. We, you know, you have to start from that safety standpoint. Right. And you build your entire operation and workflow around safety. You start doing that and you make sure you, you have a really great and healthy workplace. That to us is a, is a big, big important deal. Definitely. Now, we've learned a lot about the palletizer. Now, if we're back to the story of what happens after you click buy on Amazon.com, we've seen the inbound, we've seen the picks, we've seen things get placed into the totes, we've seen where the robots get repaired, and we've seen the palletizer, which is like, probably my favorite thing thus far, because that thing is massive and it moves very fast. But we've already given away eight $100 Amazon.com gift cards. I feel like it's time to give away more before we go to the next station. So for those of you who are on other platforms and for those of you who weren't here for the previous giveaways, I'll remind you. First things first, you have to have an Amazon.com account. And you have to be in the United States and you also have to be in the Twitch chat at twitch.tv slash first inspires. If you're on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter, please go to the Twitch site, come in the chat, and to enter, type in exclamation first rise which just so happens to be the theme of the 2019-2020 season with FIRST Robotics. So enter exclamation FIRST RISE in the chat to win a $100 Amazon gift card, and we'll see you very shortly as we head toward the slam. This is essentially the robot highway. These are my babies. Our entire operation depends on these. 
I started at Amazon just looking for a part-time job, just manually scanning boxes to pallets, and my senior leadership approached us and they said, hey, this is the project that's coming in, this is the job opportunity we have, start thinking about it. And now I get to play with robots all day. An associate will place the package on the robot, the robot knows exactly where to drop it. Each of those little shoots is a specified destination at the bottom. So a big part of my job is monitoring the activity and the traffic patterns. I'm looking for any major congestion spots. I'm looking for any robot that isn't functioning the way that it should. We've gotten a lot of on-the-job learning with regards to how these things work, how the programming works, because I had no background in robotics at all. Just having the opportunity to be a trailblazer is just absolutely phenomenal to me. I tell my family that I babysit 800 robots. I wouldn't have my job without these robots. And now when I walk in, it's kind of like, yeah, this is Amazon. It's like, this is what I do. alumni means that I have an entire world of connections. It allows me to volunteer and give back to the community. and really prepare you to solve any number of the world's big problems. The skills that you're going to be learning can completely change the future. FIRST was founded in 1989 by Dean Kamen. As an inventor, he realizes that the way to have the biggest impact is to create a whole generation of new inventors through hands-on, engaging robotics challenges. FIRST ignites passion in STEM for kids ages 6 through 18. There's four worldwide programs. Once you get the challenge, you figure out your game plan. You make a robot and you code on it. Throughout each of our programs, teams embrace first core values. Discovery. Innovation. Impact. Inclusion. Teamwork. Fun. At face value, first is a robot competition. But at the end of the day, it's so much more than that. We learn a lot about leadership, how to communicate with others, problem solving. Working together, helping other teams. Our mentors teach us not just about STEM, but about life. I think it's incredibly important for youth to see careers in science and engineering as a possibility for them. FIRST actually taught me that I'm capable of doing anything that I set my mind to. There's nothing better than seeing your robot on the field playing for the first time. They're all there like, is it gonna work? Is it gonna work? And then when it works, it's the best feeling ever. As a participant in the first program in high school, you get access to $80 million worth of scholarships. There are scholarships for colleges, universities, as well as technical programs. FIRST really develops a pipeline where there's jobs, there's careers, there's opportunities for every one of these kids based on the skills and the experiences they develop in these programs. In FIRST, every student can go pro. It's a really cool way to step into your future. I am first. Yo soy first. I am first. I am first.
Welcome back to Amazon EWR9. My name is DJ Knight. I'm here with Cedric Ross, Amazon Encyclopedia Extraordinaire. Uh, we're here at Amazon EWR showcasing the process from you clicking buy to your package shipping, all of the things in between. It's been an amazing experience thus far. We just got done checking out the palletizer. Yep. We've already shown things being brought in, everything being sorted, and then we also told four people to type in exclamation first rise in the chat to win a hundred dollar Amazon gift card. So right now, I feel like it's time that you four get your giveaways. So the four winners of the one hundred dollar Amazon gift card this time are Hacky TV, I am Cuddles, nice name, Karate Moses, and Pastry Day. That's a beautiful day. I feel like if it's pastry day, that's the best day of the week. <laughs> Give me all of your pastries I agree. and all of the coffee. Congratulations on winning $100 Amazon gift cards. Check your whispers. The moderators will be reaching out to you shortly. But we've done a lot of things. And I feel like we're winding down to the end of the process that Amazon does when it comes to somebody clicking buy. We're at the SLAM. What does the SLAM stand for? SLAM is an acronym. It stands for scan, okay. label, Application manifest. Okay. This is the part of the process where we are actually placing shipping labels onto our cartons and our envelopes. And uh, like they're, they're slamming the labels onto the boxes, right? Like I feel like it has to happen I'm, at some point. I'm going to categorically deny <laughs> that they are slamming anything. So, so there's no slamming that happens at the slam. No, no packages slamming. get destroyed. You're fine. Oh, so, because that doesn't help the customer at all. True. Right? So where's the scan start? I imagine it starts over here. Yeah. If so, let's walk through the process of the slam. Okay. So the items that are coming down the conveyor belt here are ultimately items that have been packaged for our customers. To notice when they're coming downstream here, they only have a barcode. The boxes are taped, but there's just the barcode. You don't see any shipping labels at all. So it's going to come down here, and it's going to get scanned right about here, where we will also not only scan the item, we will also weigh the item. So now the it, item is going to get weighed. It's weighing those items without them stopping. Yeah, that's right. It keeps moving. You notice it's, it kept moving, weighing. We didn't stop. It just just keep keep moving through. That is crazy. Now the conveyor belts are separating the the little black part of the conveyor belt here it helps to separate the cartons to make the scan very easy. The items have to weigh just the right amount. Like we can't be off by even so much as an ounce. So there's no deviations on weight. No deviations. So we're okay. weighing the, the item plus the packaging, right? But once it gets scanned here and weighed, information is going to go up into the cloud and come down here and we're going to be able to identify, based on that barcode, uh, the customer uh, shipping uh, preference. So if they're going to go by postal service, we're going to print a postal service label right here and then apply it. Right. If it's UPS, we're going to print a UPS label and then apply it. And the application process just comes right down close to the box, and then you'll hear that little hissing sound, which is air pushing onto the box. Thus, no slamming. But I mean, it's just slamming things with air. So like, yeah. there's no actual physical damage. Slamming air. I like just, that. We're slamming air. Slam it down exactly. with a little bit of air. But <laughs> that's actually a pretty impressive way of handling things. So between the distance of that scan and this box, yeah. it goes up to the cloud and then back down, and it prints that quick. That's yeah. That's well, crazy first of all, quick printing. That's about like six feet. Right? And it's not stopping. That's right. That's Non-stop, impressive. about six feet, up in the cloud and down, seconds, as, you, as you're seeing. All right. So you've already mentioned that we have multiple other places that they work with people. Yeah. Like, so you're working with UPS, you're working with the U.S. Postal Service. So what happens once it gets here? Like, where are these going to? So the items, uh, once we have applied the labels onto the item, they're going to go up a conveyor belt, and they're going to go right to our outbound shipping sortation process. Okay. A shipping sorter, if you will. Now, you're talking about shipping sorters, and I feel like we're going to have to stop here in a second because, you know, we got to look both ways before we cross the street. That's correct. Because safety, and nobody, nobody's coming, so we're good. Now, 
we have an important part of this process. So we've given away a lot of Amazon gift cards thus far. I, believe, I feel like we've given away 12 $100 Amazon gift cards right now. Yep. And I feel like there's some very important parts to this next bit. Exclamation FC Tours in the chat for the next part of the giveaway where we're giving away $200 Amazon gift cards. So if you haven't already joined the chat at twitch.tv slash first inspires, now is the time. Whether you're on Twitter, whether you're on Facebook, whether you're on LinkedIn, do the thing, hop in the chat. And now we get to talk about outbound. So we've seen the entire story from the beginning of somebody clicking buy. Products are being brought into Amazon. We've seen them go for, to Stowe. We've seen yeah. them get picked, placed in the totes. We've seen the palletizer, which places those totes in the places if they need to leave. And then we've seen the slam, where the labels get placed on in between the palletizer or in between the picking and the slam, they get packaged. And now we're at Outbound. What happens here? So Outbound is our uh, final stage of our process in our fulfillment center here. Um, and so it's important that we get this part right. What we're seeing right now are items that we had just packaged and placed a label onto. And then our conveyor belts are taking those items up onto our outbound shipping sortation unit. The shipping sortation unit is a carousel. You know, it's a, I'm gonna oversimplify, it's like a racing track, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the cars, moving. exactly. The cars are trays, these black trays along a belt. Now, every one of those trays has been assigned a particular shipping lane. So for instance, anything that will come down here, that means that carton has been scanned and assigned this particular shipping lane because this is the trailer, it's gonna lead to the trailer that we're gonna take this item out to. See, I was confused this entire time wondering how those packages got off. I thought there was like a big like arm that pushed them off. Yeah. It looks like they're just conveyor belts, so they just, Spin a really cool conveyor belt, and and also this great technology that allows us to be able to assign every single one of those cartons a particular sh shipping lane, which to me is really great. And so imagine, like we're getting closer and closer to our holiday season, we're going to see a lot of these lines um, in the coming weeks, full of customer packages going out to our awesome customers. And we're already standing in front of a couple of full of that, packages right? already. So that's kind of awesome. It's amazing to see this entire process from the inside. I've never seen it before, so it's I absolutely it. awesome to, to see this in person. To be perfectly honest, I love it. I want to make sure that I do share that the items that once they get here onto this conveyor belt, they'll go right into the trailer. Now this machine here will allow us to extend our um, conveyor belt all the way to the place where our employees can just pick up the box, take the box, place it onto the floor or wherever it needs to be until they have filled up the entire truck. And they're in there right now, actually. Um, one, loading up yeah, trucks. One of our, one or two of our employees are in there loading up trucks. Nice. And I think that's pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. Now, I feel like there's a lot of things that we found out. There's a lot of things that we've seen here today that would not be possible without an amazing group of engineers. And with that comes a fairly important part of everything that we've done today. Broadview Thompson Middle School in Seattle are one of 150 schools that the Amazon Future Engineer Program worked with with FIRST Robotics to sponsor their FIRST Robotics teams. And th those teams got the same tour that we got today, but we want to hear a little bit from Broadview Thompson Middle. So let's hear from them before we go any further. Wally, Terminator, BB-8. R2D2. Mailbox. Mine is probably spare parts and underwater trees and inside out. I like to do like things that just move and then I thought robotics was cool so. To me what I like is about the building and programming. <laughs> See this is definitely something I'm interested in too as a career so. That's part of the reason. Now, congratulations to Broadview Thompson Middle on starting their first LEGO League team. I'm kind of excited about it because seeing the things that those students could do with LEGO is just mind-boggling, right? It's really impressive. It is 
ridiculously impressive. But I feel like the people at home, especially the first students that are watching right now, may have questions. So if you have questions, type in exclamation Q in the chat space and give us your question right after that so we can get questions asked about the outbound area. Like it's, I did not know that there would be this many lines for traffic and that there would be conveyor, a, a massive conveyor belt that has other conveyor belts pushing packages. That's a marvel for me. All right, so I feel like questions are coming in now. Now, Pandem Fan123 asks, are the boxes recyclable? Are the boxes recyclable? Uh, yes, they are. Uh, so the cartons that were, the brown boxes that we have uh, that customers receive can actually be recycled. I should know because I actually order from Amazon as well and receive <laughs> boxes and, and truly have them in our uh, recycling bin. Yes. <laughs> Lag Lucas wants to know, what's the maximum weight that the palletizer can carry? Oh, that's a great question. So I'm going to be honest first by saying I, I don't know the exact weight. I want to be clear. Um, but I can tell you that those pallets, we're talking at a minimum roughly roughly 500 pounds minimum, right? Like so, the palletizer, the gigantic arm can lift 500 pounds? Yeah, like it, well, wow. so it depends on that particular uh, palletizer. It's only job, like just to be clear, <laughs> uh, its only job is to grab the the yellow tote and right. place it onto a pallet. It's not actually lifting. So, gotcha. um, so with that in mind, I will also share that most of the totes that we have are about twenty have about twenty five pounds worth of tote. Okay. Sorry, I I, I might have misinterpreted the question as to like the size of the okay. actual pallet. So to clarify, so each individual pallet yeah. can hold up to 500 pounds, yeah. but the but palletizer the, can grab the pallet packages, and the average of those is about 25 pounds. The average of those totes are about 25 pounds. Yep. Nice. That I do know. Now, Cast C wants to know, how does the ordering system decide which fulfillment centers to take someone's order from? Uh, so to answer that question, I will first just say that um, the technology and the, the cloud technology um, supported by Amazon Web Services is really what helps drive that, right? Right. Um, the oversimplified process, and, and I oversimplify it because it tells a story better, is that we would like to send items to customers as close to where the customer lives as possible. That would be like the best case scenario. But not everything is as close to that customer. And so we have to make other certain decisions as to how quickly can we get the item to the customer right. if it's not that close. Um, and then how do we make sure that we're doing it in the most cost effective process. So we're using some complex algorithms to make a lot of decisions. So there's a lot of um, artificial intelligence, a lot of machine learning um, that's happening. A lot of technology is used to make those decisions. But we would like first to get the item as close to the, where, where our fulfillment center is as close to the customer as possible. Awesome. Now, before we get to the next question, there is one. Remember, we're giving away four $200 Amazon.com gift cards. So be, along with typing in exclamation Q, space your question in the chat to ask a question for Cedric to answer. Also remember to be typing in exclamation FC tours and it has to be in the chat at twitch.tv slash first inspires. So if you're on Twitter, if you're on LinkedIn, if you're on Facebook, get to Twitch chat. And enter. So, W. Martinez wants to know, are all of the fulfillment centers 24 hours? Yeah, so all of our Amazon sortable fulfillment centers, like this building, and our non-sort fulfillment centers operate um, what we first say, we kind of call it 24-7, but in reality, there's about 90 minutes of the 24 hours. That is mostly downtime. A big shift is leaving um, in the wee hours of the morning and a new shift is coming in. And so for maybe, I don't know, 22 hours, 22 and a half uh, hours a day, seven days a week. That is awesome. Now, we've got one last question from Alex. How long have Amazon Robotics facilities been around? They may um, not have been facilities. Okay, Amazon Robotics Facilities. How long have the Amazon Robotics Facilities been around? Well, uh, so Amazon um, 
Robotics has been around since about, let's say, even before the facility, to be honest, right? The technology of Amazon Robotics. Um, we started working at about, I think, late 2011 or early 2012. Now, you'll have to forgive me because that was when I was on my coffee break when I was a couple years not, not around. So, but now I'm back. Understandable. Right. Coffee breaks, man. And Coffee's important. That's really important. So around, around 2012, we then started to really do a lot of research and development on Amazon Robotics. Facilities started showing up um, around 2013 and 2014, and then we started incrementally getting more Amazon film centers. Currently, we have about, uh, we have more than 50 robotic fulfillment centers worldwide. Wow. That's a large number of fulfillment centers. How many fulfillment centers are there globally? So globally, we have uh, more than 275 fulfillment centers worldwide. Wow. Um, and really, it's so great because it allows us to really fulfill customer orders. I mean, it's all to, to really make a good impact on our, on our customers. That's amazing. Well, Cedric, thank you so much for this amazing tour. I've been blown away many a time, <laughs> and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Now, Me too. we did have four people that entered to win $200 Amazon gift cards, and I feel like they might want to know what they've won. So the four winners of the final giveaway for the $200 Amazon gift cards are, starting with Jake304, Grover Tech, Joey Bunn, and Jimmy Dom. Congratulations on winning your $200 Amazon gift cards. Thank you very much to Amazon for the opportunity to have this amazing tour, and thank you for coming to hang out with us. Now, we still have a couple more questions. Uh, can you tell us about the Amazon Future Engineer Scholarship? I certainly can, um, but I want to make sure I get this right because I think it's really important, so I'm going to read a little bit out of this. That's fair. So our Amazon Future Engineer Scholarship, uh, it's one part of our child, childhood to career program aimed at increasing access to computer science for children and young adults from underserved and underrepresented communities. Our scholarship, which opens in two weeks, provides $10,000 a year for four years. It comes with a guaranteed paid internship at Amazon during the summer. Find out more at our website, amazonfutureengineer.com. Now that is amazing. Now, it is super awesome. I've been lucky enough to get the tour here. This has been absolutely impressive. There are 23 Amazon fulfillment centers that you can get tours at in, North in America. the United yep. States. So go to amazon.com slash fctours to check out if there's a fulfillment center near you that you can get a tour at as well. And I would be remiss in an Amazon facility on a Twitch channel to not remind people that if you like video games, and you have a Twitch account, and you have Amazon Prime, you also get Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon account to your Twitch account, which gets you not only free games, but also free goodies for games. Like I just got, I just claimed something that came out today in a game that I'm a fan of. I don't know if I can talk about it, so I'm not gonna say the game, but it's, yes, I'm excited about it. Uh, and you also get the ability to subscribe to the Twitch channel of your choice for free every That's month. That's awesome. And you're in twitch.tv slash first inspire, so I mean you could, Hit the subscribe button with your Twitch Prime and spread robots around Twitch for the next month. <laughs> it costs you nothing. You already have Amazon Prime. But I'm DJ Knight. I'm here with Cedric Ross. We've been given this amazing tour of Amazon EWR 9 in New Jersey. We've seen the entire process between, well, a simplified process from when you click buy to when an Amazon package leaves the facility. It's been an amazing time. Thanks for tuning in. And if you have enjoyed any of this, make sure to follow twitch.tv slash first inspires. There's going to be more amazingness coming soon. Have a great night. We'll see you soon. I walk to school almost every day. It's not the safest neighborhood. Sometimes it can be a bit frightening. Leo is, in all my years of teaching, the most amazing student that I've ever had. He's brilliant. My name is Leotzin Jean-Baptiste, but I also go by Leo. I'm a student at Orange High School in Orange, New Jersey. It does get difficult at times worrying about money and mostly worrying about taking care of my brothers. There's been times where I've felt like giving up. He's always sitting in the corner with a book, 
I love my mom. She's my hero. She works constantly to make sure that even if we can't afford everything, at least we have a house, we have food. In the future, I think I want to become an artificial intelligence or machine learning researcher. At first, college wasn't really a reality. I decided to apply for the Amazon scholarship because I thought it was a great opportunity. Being able to potentially get an internship with Amazon and just saying I'm an Amazon future engineer, that is something that Leo definitely is excited about. Today, this box all of a sudden came to him from Amazon. Let's do this. Hey, Leo. We just package from Amazon coming today. You're one of a select group of students to receive this four-year, $10,000 a year scholarship. Yes! <laughs> yes! Oh. <laughs> In addition to the scholarship, we would like to offer you a paid software engineering internship. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you, Mama. It's mm. a big load off my shoulder. I'm shy. I, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> so we're happy that you guys chose him. You won't regret it. I want to cry right now.